Everywhere you look at the moment, people are talking about inflation. And it's being blamed on all manner of different causes. It's being blamed on China's COVID policy, on the war in Ukraine, on supply chains after the pandemic. But almost everyone fails to understand the main driver of inflation. And as a property investor, you need to understand it. So that's what I'm gonna break down for you in this video. Let's start with the real basics, what inflation actually is, because this is misunderstood in itself. The dictionary definition of inflation is, a persistent substantial rise in the general level of prices related to an increase in the volume of money and resulting in the loss of value of currency. That's a long definition and we'll break it down bit by bit. But what it's basically saying is the amount of money in the economy is what matters when it comes to inflation. There are other factors that affect some prices some of the time, but the only thing that affects all prices all the time is the amount of money in the economy. So let's break this down. To start with, has there actually been an increase in the amount of money in the economy? Well, we can look at a couple of charts to show this. Let's start by looking at the period from 1900 to 1955. And as you can see, the total amount of money in the economy has increased over that period of time. And there are a couple of points where the amount of money was increasing particularly fast. What were these times? World wars. Wars are expensive. You need to create a lot of money in order to fight them. So you can see a bump for World War I and you can see a bigger increase around World War II. So that's 1900 to the 1950s. But what about a longer period of time that takes us up to where we are today? Well, you can see that on this chart. And as you can see, the amount of money that's been created in the economy since the 1970s is just astonishing. It happens at such a pace. You have to zoom out so far to be able to see it. You can't even see those increases for the world wars anymore. An absolutely astonishing amount of money has been created over the last 50 years. And the next bit is resulting in the loss of value of currency. So has currency, the pound in our case, lost value? Well, you can see that using a measure called buying power. This basically tells you what you could have bought for some amount of money, say £100, all the way back through history. And you have to do some statistical techniques to work this out because the things that we spend money on are different now from what they were hundreds of years ago. But you can do it and you can work out if a pound will buy you the same amount as it would have been way back in history. This chart goes all the way back to 1837. And you can see that for the first 60, 70 years or so, the buying power of £100, which is what we're looking at here, it fluctuated a little bit, but it was relatively steady. But then, from then onwards, the decline is absolutely enormous. You can see it. I don't need to explain it. And the end result of that is the pound has lost 99% of its buying power, 99% of its value since 1837. In other words, the amount of money that would have bought you £100 worth of goods in 1837 would buy you 87 pence worth today. Absolutely incredible. This is the amazing thing about inflation. You kind of know it's happening. It ha most of the time it's happening slowly. At the moment, it's happening a bit quicker than that, but you don't really think about it. But over long periods of time, the impact is absolutely incredible. So why does this happen? Why is it that more money in the economy means that the buying power of the pound declines. First, it sounds weird, but when you think about it, it actually makes perfect sense. It's purely supply and demand. The more you have of something, the less one unit of that thing is gonna be worth. It's true of any kind of goods you can imagine, and it's true of currency as well. You can see this quite clearly by taking it to an extreme. So imagine the government went absolutely nuts and it printed a load of money and it deposited a million pounds in everyone's bank account. So you wake up tomorrow, you're a millionaire. What would happen to prices? Clearly, the price of everything would go through the roof because you've got all this extra money, which is all this extra demand effectively. People have got the ability to go out and buy a load more at what the prices were, but nothing more is being produced. Nothing has changed. The physical amount of stuff, goods and services you can buy has been unaffected. All that can happen is prices go up, which is another way of saying that the buying power of your pound has decreased. Another way to demonstrate this point, which is really, really interesting, especially for property investors, is when you look at house prices and you look at house prices in pounds, which is obviously what we're used to doing, but then you also look at house prices in gold. Now, gold is something with actual scarcity. It's got a long history as being used in relation to money, but even apart from that, 
it's scarce. There's only so much gold and you can't suddenly double the amount of it. You have to go and dig it out of the ground. The gold supply increases by about 2% each year and there's not a great deal you can do to speed that up. So gold is inherently scarce. What happens then when you compare house prices in something scarce, which is gold, to something not scarce, which is pounds? Well, this graph shows you and what it shows is absolutely unbelievable. So this plots the average UK house price from the 1950s all the way up to today. It uses something called indexation to equalize the prices in pounds and gold in 1950, and then projects forward from there to see what happens. And what happens is just unbelievable because you know that house prices in pounds have gone up quite a lot over time. That's not gonna be news. In fact, since the 1970s, they've gone up around about a hundredfold in pounds. But in gold, as you can see, it costs roughly the same amount of gold to buy a house today as it did in the 1970s. So this is just an amazing thing. And so when you're saying house prices have gone up, really it's just another way of saying, well, the pound that you're measuring houses in has gone down. It's absolutely amazing. And by the way, you can do the same for other goods and assets as well. So think about food. Food prices go up every year because of inflation. In pounds they do anyway, but if you look at food prices in gold, they've become dramatically cheaper over time. And when you think about it, this is exactly what you'd expect. Over time, we get better at producing things. We get more efficient, we get quicker. It gets, the technology improves. And as a result, you would expect prices to come down. It doesn't make any sense that prices go up. And as we've just seen, the only reason actually that prices go up is that the value of the pound that you're measuring everything in is falling. So this is all very interesting. Well, it is to me anyway, but what can you actually do with this? What can you take away from everything that we've spoken about? Well, for me, there are four key points. The first one is that inflation is inevitable. If the amount of pounds goes up faster than the amount of stuff you can buy with pounds, there will be inflation. Will this continue in the future? Well, it seems highly likely. Again, there are lots of reasons for this, which I won't go into right now, maybe in another video, especially when you consider that it's actually happening at a faster and faster pace over time. So this chart shows you the growth in the amount of base money, which is a subset of all money that's created by the Bank of England. And it shows you that between uh, 2010 and today. And yeah, it's been increasing the whole time. But just look at that increase in 2020. The line goes pretty much vertical. And why was that? Well, that was COVID-related spending. That was necessary, the government and the Bank of England thought at least, to get the economy out of that situation without too much damage. Although we are now seeing the damage of that, which is the inflation that we have right now. The second point, which is really the biggie for property investors, is that property will tend to hold its value in the face of inflation. In other words, it will rise at at least the same pace as inflation, if not faster. You can have some confidence in that continuing because it's been happening for such a long time, but that's not enough. The reason is that properties are valued ultimately based on the rental income stream that they produce. And yet yeah, there are lots of other factors. There are times when people will pay more and or less because of sentiment or other reasons, but ultimately that's the anchor to property prices. It's the amount of rental income they can produce. This is important because rents tend to rise in line with inflation. So if rents increase in line with inflation, then house prices you'd expect to as well. Again, over a long period of time, on average, after lots of fluctuations along the way. But why do rents rise in line with inflation? Well, it's because rents are driven basically by people's ability to pay rent. In other words, by earnings. And earnings tend to rise in line with inflation. Again, not all the time, not by a steady amount, but over a long enough period of time. So earnings drive rents, rents drive property prices. Therefore, as long as incomes continue to rise in line with inflation, house prices ultimately will do as well. You can clearly see that in this chart, which shows house prices, rents, and earnings going back to 2005. It's hard to get good rental data going back earlier than that, but we can go back to 2005 and look at a decent chunk of time. And as you can see, there's a very clear relationship. The three of them tend to move together. Not perfectly, and as you can see, actually recently, rents have started to lag the other two, but you would expect this pattern to hold and therefore rents will catch up. And this is particularly interesting because when people go on about how high rents are and how greedy landlords are and pushing up rents and all the rest of it, you can see, actually, that's not the case, but that's for another video. 
The third big takeaway is that debt is your friend. The great thing about being a property investor is it's relatively easy to borrow large amounts of money at decent rates with relatively low risk as long as you're sensible compared to other forms of borrowing. And the key thing is the amount you're borrowing is a fixed number of pounds. The amount you're borrowing doesn't go up in line with inflation, but whatever you invest in will do and your rental income stream will do as well. So you've got an asset that's going up in value, at least in line with inflation, so you can say it's holding its value in real terms. Well, the amount that you owe is falling in real terms. And you can see the impact of this really dramatically over a long period of time. So imagine 100 years ago, you'd borrowed 20 pounds from someone. Back then, 100 years ago, 20 pounds would have been enough to pay your rent for the month and still have enough money to go out for dinner afterwards. It's unbelievable, but it's true. And then imagine that you had to pay that money back today. You and whoever you're borrowing from have clearly been keeping yourselves in good shape. Well, now, 20 pounds is almost nothing. You could hand it over barely noticing it's gone. That's because 20 pounds that you owe is still 20 pounds, but the buying power of that 20 pounds is so much less. And you don't have to live to be hundreds of years old to see the benefit of this. It works over short periods of time too. It's just less dramatic and it happens slowly and you can't see it happening. But since the year 2000, not that long ago, the pound has lost 45% of its value. It's incredible, but it's true. Therefore, if you took out a mortgage in the year 2000, then the real value of that mortgage would have basically halved without you paying a penny back. It's really amazing stuff. And the fourth and final thing to take away from this is these big forces like inflation, like interest rates, they drive everything. You can make good or bad investments, but overall, the, the fate of your investments is so tied to what's happening in the overall financial system. The trouble is most people don't understand this at all. And most journalists actually don't understand it either. So most of what you see about this in the popular press will be wrong. But if you understand these big trends, if you understand how the world is set up, how we got here, and therefore what's likely to happen next, you can tune out all that noise. You can take a long-term view, you can take out the emotion, and you can make smarter investment decisions. And ultimately, that's what we're all trying to do. I hope you enjoyed this video. I love talking about the subject. Hope you've enjoyed hearing about it. If you did, hit the like button so we know to do more like this in the future, and make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss what we've got coming up next.